there's a, there's a funny internal New Yorker story about that novel, novel novella, which was published in its entirety in the New Yorker, I believe. Roger Angel was the editor, um, and let's say they they had an interesting and complex relationship. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a dog in the story in the in, that thinks, and that and that has ideas and senses the discontent, but is sort of cerebrally far superior to most dogs that one runs across, with no offense to the two dogs that are <laughs> sitting down there. And Roger kept on trying to get Maxwell to take the dog out, or at least to take the dog's thinking out. And Roger Angel is not someone whom you can stare down easily, but for Maxwell, it was nothing. He simply said, like Bartleby, I'd prefer to keep it. And that was that. It, it was a tribute to Tolstoy, I imagine. Uh, probably. Because he had always wanted to, he said he had always wanted to write like Tolstoy. Um, and in that part, I think he did. In fact, I did the same thing in a later novel of mine, giving the dog the thoughts. And I gave the dog its own section there with deep <laughs> thoughts. And the editor had the same reaction there. Right. And I had the same fight with him right. about it. But I considered it a tribute to, to William Maxwell and to Tolstoy and all those. It's an amazing passage because the, the narrator, the book is narrated from a person, but there are whole points of the book, parts of the book where the narrator disappears. And quite fluently at this one point, the book begets, is told, I think not in a jarring way, but the book is told for five pages or seven pages from the point of view of the dog. And, and, and I think from Bill's point of view, it, it gave the novel a chance to express something that the human speaker couldn't express. And the, at the end, the dog, everything is being taken away from the dog, everything. And at the end, the dog is just reduced to a howl. And, and I think that aside from the argument about whether it was a good idea or not, there's a point in that book where it's really a very primal howl and the dog expresses it. Yeah, plus, I mean, he's, he's playing around with omniscience there so much. He says, you know, but for this I'm going to have to create, you know, a farm and a boy and a dog and yeah. all this, and, you know, and then he goes ahead and he sort of right in front of your eyes says, I'm going to make this appear, and he makes it all appear. And Roger Angel objected to certain aspects of doggy consciousness in and that story. Imagine and that in 1980, right? <coughs> post Bottle May. I mean, that's that's ridiculous. But he kept saying, no, he, he kept on saying that uh, Maxwell said, uh, "I happen to be an authority on doggy consciousness. <laughs> this is based on our dog Daisy, who, and the dog is capable of everything my dog is is capable of." Uh, um, take it from me. Take it from Daisy. Um, Trixie, the dog in this story is authentic. So you, so you all, I mean, Ed's just given a spirited and brilliant uh, explanation of the dog and his thinking. But I think it's also fair to say that one can read those sections and that passage as to, to say that they were somewhat sentimental. I mean, I know that's odd because it flies in the face of what you said, but I can see I didn't share that response, partly because I respected and admired Maxwell so much that I sort of had an automaticity of saying, he can do what he wants, and I read the book with great pleasure and with tears, um, but I can see somebody finding, finding that a little hard to take. Makes sense. I think equally as hard to take is a short story in which a couple comes home from their um, Christmas party, it's a story called The Lily White Boys. And they come home to their apartment and they find the apartment's been broken into. And there's no talking dog in this story, but items that are in the apartment talk to each other. Um, there's a little moment of fantasy where, uh, where they are witnesses to the crime that the, uh, that the owners of the apartment didn't witness. Um, the bottle of Estee Lauder perfume has its moment on the stage 
talking about how much worse things could have been. You know. <laughs> and, and you, they you could see, have knocked me over. <laughs> you see that, in, and also in um, they came like swallows, and time will darken it. They're inanimate objects that are given right. this this sort of emotional place, I guess, in the story, and, and that talk to the the characters and tell them things. And when you went to visit him, you really felt like. I mean, the cat was clearly alive, but there was some feeling that the bookcases were alive, too. <laughs> Absolutely. And the box was alive, and, and uh, you were in a force field of... Uh... It's, fern it's true. There's something I was thinking. I was looking at the cover of the tribute book and looking at the desk in Yorktown, yeah. and I was thinking, it looks like Maxwell. I mean, That's true. it just does. And it's not... Now I'm being sentimental, but it's nevertheless true. It, it did. He get, he had tea every afternoon. I think I think it was in the afternoon. Cup, which was had an aura about it. It was his cup, and it was sort of almost frightening and Houdini-like. He was a magician in some ways. He was a magician. They, you know, in the Book of Common Prayer, they say things visible and invisible. He was always talking with confidence about the invisible things, about, as good as you mentioned, souls. I mean, he was the, you know, some people just don't believe souls exist. With Bill, the teapot had a soul, a spirit. <laughs> Once you said, Ben, in a piece that you wrote about him that Bill did not believe in God, and that you said you had no problem believing in God, you just had a hard time believing in Bill Maxwell. <laughs> <laughs> we we used to have this uh, staged argument where I would uh, profess and defend Christianity, and he would. Uh, but, but his writing is much more religious than mine is. And and he and he told me he he, he sent me to that Tolstoy story, Man and Master, which is. Do you remember that? I mean, that's a story that <laughs> it does. It almost reverses the last hundred years of the Catholic Church, you know, <laughs> you know the bad work they've done in bringing faith back. It's such a powerful evocation of, of a spiritual world and a, con a spiritual continuity that continues after death. But I went to church and had crackers and grape juice. It was a very <laughs> small.